Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, and welcome to a very unique webinar to help kick off 2021. We're committed to discussing the hard topics and investigating those technologies that may impact our industry today and going forward. We know this is a very difficult topic, and we want to reiter reiterate that Dowchem does not support the development of lab-based meat, but we think it's important to know how it's done and to understand the science behind it to inform ourselves, our customers, and the consumer. Today's Real Science webinar is titled Lab-Based Meat Production, Science Fiction or Reality. And we will hear from one of the leading scientists behind this technology, Dr. Mark Post from Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Know that this is a safe place to ask questions, so feel free to submit your comments and thoughts to Dr. Post throughout the presentation. We will collect all the questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If we don't have time to answer your specific question today, we'll send a follow-up email with the answers to all the questions submitted during today's presentation. I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Post. Professor Post is an MD and PhD and chair of the physiology department at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. His main research interest is the engineering of tissues for medical applications and for food, which has led to the development of cultured beef from bovine skeletal muscle stem cells in an effort to supplement traditional livestock-based meat production. In August 2013, he presented the world's first hamburger for cultured beef. He is CSO and co-founder of two companies, Masa Meat and Corium, that will commercialize cultured meat and cultured leather. As a founder and of uh, the technology, he is the perfect representative to give us an inside look into the technology and the science behind it. Dr. Post, pleasure having you here today and the floor is now yours. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Scott, and uh, thanks everybody to, for being here and thanks Belkham for organizing this. Um, uh, I realize this is a somewhat uncomfortable uh, subject for most of you and I, I really commend the, the forward looking um, attitude of Belkham to actually host me and try to um, explain to you what this technology is about and why we are doing this. Um, so I, um, like probably most of you, I like meat and um, uh, that's fine. It's a wonderful product. It's very nutritious. Um, it's uh, tasting um, tremendously good um, and it gives a good uh, satiety. Um, and we have been doing this for a long time. Um, however, I think most of you realize, and if not, then, um, then you probably should, is that it's actually a very resource intense uh, part of our diet. Um, most of this, we are talking about beef mostly, so I, I realize that not all of you are in uh, beef production or in that area, but um, we focus on beef for the reason that this is an animal that is particularly inefficient in converting um, its feed into animal proteins uh, for uh, meat. Um, so the conversion ratio is generally to be thought about uh, one in eight. So every um, uh, kilo of meat requires eight kilos of uh, proteins from other sources to basically produce that. Um, it translates into, um, for instance, grains, uh, how many uh, pounds of grain are used for a hamburger, um, how much water, quite a bit of uh, fresh water, uh, land, uh, 850 square meters per, per hamburger, and quite a bit of energy. Um, basically, this is the amount of energy that is enough to power your microwave for about uh, 10 minutes. Um, and it has to do with the feed conversion ratio, as you probably are better aware of than, than I am. And for beef, it's particularly um, inefficient. For pigs, it's more, much more efficient. For chicken, even more. And for salmon, it's pretty close to plants. Um, so the FAO in 2008 for the first time, and they revisited it in 2011, um, estimated that about 70% of all our arable land is actually used to grow um, uh, animals for um, uh, meat production. And they also estimate that in 2050, uh, meat consumption will be 70% higher of what it is right now. Now that may be good news for people who produce meat, but we basically don't have the resources. Um, why is this, why is this uh, increase happening? It's mostly because in India and China and at some point Africa and, and uh, South America, 
people start to eat more meat. If they are uh, wealthier, middle class incomes rise in numbers, people start to eat meat. And we basically, according to the calculations right now, if nothing ever, uh, uh, if nothing else happens, we just don't have enough resource for, resources for that. So meat producers also have to start selling no to um, customers. Now we can all become vegetarians and to some degree that is increasing as you probably um, are aware, um, uh, I sometimes go in, in, in Europe to universities, admittedly, um, uh, and people under the age of 25, 30, these highly educated people, um, a, a large number of them um, have become vegetarian and some of them, of course, stay vegetarian. So that's an increasing trend. I think we will see that throughout the world, um, but it's still a very small number. And so what are the alternatives? Uh, well, in the medical field, we have been using stem cells and tissue engineering to produce tissues for regenerative purposes, for people who have lost tissue due to surgery or um, accidents. And um, when you think about stem cells, typically you think about embryonic stem cells, cells that can proliferate and can form an entire uh, human being or a cow for that matter. Um, but what most people don't know is that all of our organs have dedicated stem cells and our muscle have specifically numerous stem cells in it that are basically sitting there waiting to repair tissue when it's injured. So if you cut your muscle, um, the stem cells come in, they proliferate and they start to rebuild that muscle tissue so that you don't get a scar, but you get functional muscle tissue in return. Um, so we use that technology that actually has been described uh, many, many years ago to um, start making meat. So we take a biopsy from a cow, basically half a gram of tissue, uh, one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, has a couple of thousands of the stem cells. We uh, take them out and we let them proliferate. Uh, we can culture them in uh, culture dishes in the laboratory at uh, 37 or 38 degrees, right humidity and so forth. And of course you need to feed the cells as well. That replicative capacity of the cells is so big that you can, from a very small piece of muscle, let's say half a gram, you can make thousands of kilos of meat. Um, and that would eventually allow you to reduce the number of cows and therefore um, reduce also the resource intensity of this system. Um, once you have these cells, of course, they are not really meat yet, they don't have a taste, they are not really protein rich, so from a nutritional value point of view, it's not really up to um, a par, so you need to make muscle tissue out of it. Uh, by the way, we are doing the same with fat tissue, I will discuss this a little bit less, but uh, we are doing the same with fat tissue, and eventually you combine. The principle is the same. Um, so one feature of a muscle cell is that um, it's actually a merger of a large number of cells. Um, so the first step into getting from cells to muscle is to let them merge. That's a quite a simple instruction in the lab. You basically take out all the stimuli for them to grow and then they start to uh, merge into what we call a myotube, a very primitive muscle fiber, still not a lot of protein, but already the beginning of a muscle fiber. Um, and then we need to do something that we are borrowing from tissue engineering for medical uh, purposes is that we let them self-organize into a muscle fiber of multiple of those primitive fibers. So for that, we need to submerge them in a gel. Um, I will talk about that gel later. And uh, we place them in a, a ring structure that you see on the left side here. Um, around a central column, and they, when, they, when that happens, they start to find each other, um, they start to attach to each other and squeeze out all the water of the gel, and they start to contract. Um, our muscle, even in a Petri dish, start to contract kind of spontaneously. Um, and because they are in this ring structure and they're kind of grabbing each other by the tail, that contraction leads to tension. Tension is a big trigger for muscle cells to produce protein. 
uh, it's the same thing when you go to the gym and you pump iron. The tension is a bigger trigger to get thick muscle than, for instance, walking, uh, running a marathon. So it's not the, really the movement itself, it's the tension. So we let that happen for about three weeks. In the meantime, we uh, uh, nourish them, of course, we nurture them. And uh, within three weeks, they make a muscle fiber that under the microscope looks exactly the same as the muscle fiber that we took right out of the car. Um, so in 2013, we did that um, uh, on a uh, still a lab scale, but uh, we made 10,000 of these muscle fibers, which was, I, I can tell you, very tedious work, um, and made the first hamburger in the world made out of these stem cells. This was cooked and eaten in a hybrid between a cooking show um, in London and uh, two food critics ate it and they said, oh yeah, this is a hamburger. And uh, by the way, this cost us about $330,000 to make. Um, so it was not a product, it was a proof or at least a showcase that this can be done um, and that we should start or should or could develop this uh, technology further and hopefully in the end be able to scale it up and make it, of course, affordable for people. So that was the stage in, in 2013. The principle of making this meat is still the same. You use the stem cells, you let them proliferate, and you let them make tissue. Just the way they do this in the cow, but then outside of the cow. Now, in the meantime, uh, we are now uh, 2021, and a, a fair number of companies have popped up doing similar things, but also diverging a little bit from this idea. Um, and if you if you see this uh, schematic uh, on your upper left, the, the muscle tissue that you recognize, and then if you microscopically uh, zoom into that, you see uh, muscle bundles and then muscle fibers and then an individual muscle fiber that is that merged uh, group of cells. Um, and then if you zoom even further down in the cell, you see all the proteins. Um, and most of the muscle proteins are contractile proteins, are actin and myosin and uh, titin and a couple of those proteins, a very uh, repetitive structure. And so what we now see is that some companies are actually focusing on just producing these proteins um, in, for instance, a recombinant fermentation system using a yeast or a bacteria. Um, to grow these single proteins, harvest them, and make a protein mixture that has the same nutritional value. But of course, that's not meat. It doesn't have the same texture and so forth. Um, then there are companies, and there's now a term, in, especially in the U.S., where uh, they call this cell-based meat, um, that uses actually those cells that I showed as ingredients in an otherwise plant-based uh, product. Um, and then there is a company like ours, um, which is focusing on the muscle fibers, letting those muscle fibers produce themselves um, and start contracting and start to build up the protein quality that you typically require for muscle. Um, and then there are companies who already start to make the entire tissue um, think a ribeye steak. They're not that, that far yet, but a ribeye steak where you have the muscle in a full thickness piece of uh, meat together with the fat. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the flavors that you have out there yet. Mind you, um, just to be sure and to have no misunderstanding, there's no product on the market yet. Um, so this is all still in R&D phase and is going to, but it's going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, at small scale. Okay, so how do you go from this proof of principle, this $330,000 hamburger, to something that you can actually produce at scale? Well, you have to think about the culture conditions um, to make those efficient and uh, uh, very and scalable. Uh, you have to think about the cells. Are the cells that you are using actually the final cells, or can you refine that? Can you improve that? Um, and you have to scale up. Cell culture and tissue culture is not by itself a easily scalable procedure, so you have to think of ways to, uh, to do that. So when we take the cells out of a sample, we separate them into two fractions. One is, they both come from the muscle, but one is a muscle precursor, so a, a, 
um, a, a, the start of a muscle um, production line and the other is the start of a fat production line. So we separate those and we culture them separately, we make the tissue separately and then we combine them into a patty. Um, if you take that from, this is just a example where we on the, on the y-axis we have uh, replication of those cells, so um, a number of uh, doublings of those cells. Um, and on the x-axis we have the days and the different graphs are from different animals. And you see if you take those stem cells um, from those animals, their, their replication rate is pretty similar, actually. There's not that much difference from animal to animal, which is good news for us because that would allow you to uh, make a much more robust uh, production system. Um, and as I mentioned, um, it, it, this is a, a highly dependent on that replication of those cells. And if you um, uh, here on the um, y-axis, mind you, this is an exponential axis. So every, um, every uh, item kind of doubles. And the cells, of course, with every doubling, ones go to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to um, 16, and so forth. So if you, if you do the, those calculations and you get those cells to double about 32 times, um, you can generate 2,000 kilos of meat. Theoretically, they can go to 50 doublings. We have not achieved that yet, but uh, theoretically, they can do that. And then from that very small sample, you can make a tremendous amount of uh, meat. And of course, that's for production purposes, but also to reduce the number of animals, in our view at least, is possible. Okay, this is a little bit technical, so I will just go over it very quickly, but you may have seen this in, uh, maybe in the media even, um, that some people are, some companies are actually using a little bit more like an embryonic stem cell. So a cell that is even more primitive, that can proliferate even more, uh, but then you have slight difficulty in getting it to differentiate into muscle because it can also differentiate into bone, into uh, um, brain tissue, into blood, into anything. So you have to steer it in a way so that it specifically becomes muscle tissue or fat tissue. Um, and that requires uh, genetic modification. Now, some companies are not shying away from that. We are in a, uh, our company is in a, a European market, and so we, um, we kind of shy away from uh, genetic modification. Not because we don't believe in it or not like it, but because we know that consumers will have a big problem with accepting that. Now, how do you scale up um, from something that you do in a Petri dish where you have only limited capacity to scale up? Well, um, technologies have been developed um, to uh, do this in big bioreactors, in big tanks. They can go up to 25,000 or even 100,000 liters uh, where you grow the cells on little spheres. So you see here in the, the black images, you see the big spheres and the little bright dots on it. The little bright dots are the cells and the big spheres are things that are floating in that um, soup. Um, and the cells grow actually on those uh, microcarriers. And we have tested quite a few of them. Uh, this is a system that works very nicely and you can thereby scale up this production in large fermenter type of systems. So it would look like this. You start uh, on the left with uh, what's here called a cryovial with a very small number of cells and then you go increasingly to larger uh, bioreactors and you end up on the right side with kind of a brewery type of system where you uh, grow the cells in large tanks. And of course you do that for uh, both muscle and fat, again, separately and then later you combine them. So if you translate that from a typical, this is a Dutch example, um, the, the farms here are typically small, uh, 250 um, cows per farm. Um, and if you look at the output of that farm, which is uh, 35 tons per year of meat, that would equate to having um, 1,000 liter bioreactors, which is still a relatively small size, um, and four of them. Uh, they can work continuously um, throughout the year to produce meat. So this is, at a farm level, it would translate 250 animals 
into something that you see on the right hand side, um, thousand liter bioreactors and then four of them. Um, globally, that would of course translate into a much higher fermentation volume. Um, and on the lower side here, you see that for the total world consumption, which is currently about 300 million tons per year, uh, it would require uh, uh, 20 million cube meters of bioreactor volume. And that probably doesn't tell you very much, but it's roughly one and a half the total fermentation capacity that we have today. And the total fermentation capacity today is used for um, in pharma, in, um, in the bio industry, in, for biofuel production. Um, so we have a lot of capacity and we need to double that and then a bit more to, to actually, if you would transform the entire uh, meat sector into this. Now, can we actually replicate the same tissue in terms of color in terms of texture and in terms of taste. Um, and that for sure is a challenge. Uh, this is a, again, a wonderful product. I love the product and it's really, really hard to get to exactly the same uh, quality. So here you see, um, this is a histological image of a muscle um, and you see the muscle fibers here on the right here in pink and you see that um, some of those um, uh, proteins, some of those typical muscle proteins are actually present in those muscle fibers. Now this is still a very small piece of muscle um, and it's definitely not a full thickness, but it, it already creates that structure and has the uh, muscle or the protein quality that you uh, would require. Um, we, um, this is not easy to do. Um, it's it's doable, but it's not easy to do. You have to, we spend basically the last seven years of improving this and perfecting this so that you can get to a, a, a tissue fiber that actually has the same texture and the same nutritional quality, or not the same, but very similar to, uh, to me. Um, you can do all sorts of tricks. That's the advantage of doing this in a very, confined environment like a laboratory um, where you can play with the feeding of the cells, with uh, mechanical stimulation, with temperature, with um, volumes, and also you can actually electrically stimulate the muscle. This is just to show you in this little movie that the muscle is actually living um, and that it contracts when you uh, electrically stimulate it. And when you electrically stimulate it, um, it um, starts to produce more of that protein that you eventually um, want. Now, this is a, a very uh, technical slide. This is basically to show that um, the muscle also produces a protein called myoglobin. Um, and myoglobin is a hemoglobin type of um, protein that is produced by the muscle itself and that typically gives it its red color. Red color of beef comes from partly from myoglobin mostly and partly from residual amounts of hemoglobin that are still in uh, the muscle. But um, most of it actually, well, a little bit over half of it is uh, myoglobin. And this is produced by the cells themselves. It pr produces the red color. Um, it supposedly also adds to the taste. Um, this is one of the reasons why impossible foods in the U.S. has uh, incorporated a myoglobin type of protein into their um, uh, uh, plant-based hamburgers. Um, and it also adds the heme iron, which is a um, cherished nutritional value of uh, red meat. As I said, we're also making fat tissue. We have started that after 2013. The 2013 hamburger did not have fat tissue. We're now making uh, fat tissue, and this is actually quite successful because we can convert 100% of the cells that we are growing into fat cells. Um, you see those red uh, uh, little balls, like it's like a Christmas tree almost, on the, the right lower side. These are um, uh, laid, cells laden with uh, fat, very similar to uh, fat tissue that you get straight from the cow. They're still somewhat smaller in size, but they are 
um, they have, and this, this is shown here, this is again a very complex slide, um, you see here the fat composition of the fat that we are making. So the lower two bars are uh, fat from cows, and you see the color coding comes from uh, all the fatty acid chains that we have in that uh, material. Um, so it ranges from a 16 carbon uh, fatty acids to a 22 carbon fatty acid with different levels of saturation and different uh, positions of saturation. As you see here in the pattern that, um, so the, the upper um, eight bars or so are uh, tissues that we have produced and you see that some of like a POP2 from cow C and POP2 from cow D are actually getting pretty close to the one of uh, the real fat from the cow. And that will translate into uh, taste and into uh, texture. So how about, you know, is this actually going to help um, in terms of the problems that we have identified, the resource intensity, the uh, greenhouse gas emission, and, and basically the, maybe the, the, the unsustainability of uh, future livestock meat production in view of the increased demand globally. Um, so for that, you have to look at every different component. Is that actually available? Um, is that sufficiently available? Do you still need animals for that? And so the, the, the hamburger in 2013 still required quite a bit of animal components for it to be made. Um, the cells will always be of animal component, at least in our view, but that's not a problem because they are, they, they replicate so much. But if you start using materials that don't replicate, then uh, you are in trouble. So traditionally, you use for this uh, cell culture, you use uh, serum. And serum is a blood derived product from unborn calves. Um, so you can immediately understand that this is um, going to be very, very problematic. Um, so we had to get rid of serum. Uh, we also had that gel in which those cells are sitting, that those muscle cells are sitting to form that ring structure was actually an animal-based gel, was basically a gelatin type of um, structure. So we had to get rid of that too. Um, and finally, in order to make it resource efficient, we have to start thinking about recycling. So we have um, spent about half a year of getting rid of the serum. This is not rocket science, it's just uh, we know already um, a lot of what is required for this material to become serum-free, as we call it. Um, and so we just have optimized this system for our particular cells, and we now have um, a serum-free medium, so we're no, no longer using serum, which is actually more effective than the, its uh, serum uh, uh, cousin. Also, the gel that, that the cells are sitting in when they make that ring structure, um, I mentioned was gelatin, sometimes also fibrin. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting thing if you, uh, what, what the function of this gel is together with those cells. Um, so it's, it's a famous experiment here on the right is a Petri dish with uh, that gel kind of in a blob on the floor of the Petri dish. And the two black stripes are actually silk wires that are attached to the bottom of the Petri dish. And if you don't do anything, nothing happens. It stays there forever. If you throw in a couple of cells in that gel, um, within 24 hours, oops, um, it reorganizes that gel um, into a fibrous structure in between those silk wires. And the cells in there start to align, they find each other, and they form a muscle tissue. What is required for that is that the, the cells actually grab the polymer structure. Gel is basically 99% uh, water and 1% kind of a polymer, uh, can be a biomaterial or a synthetic polymer that holds this water together. Um, and so for the, the cells don't do anything with the water, but they do something with those polymer structures. They, they grab those polymer structures, uh, draw them towards each other uh, and squeeze out all the water. And this is a functionality that you have to replicate. Um, if you, collagen has that by itself or gelatin, uh, but if you want to use something else, you have to replicate that. 
So we used um, alginate, which is food compatible, it's readily available, um, and it's very, very cheap. And it forms very nice gels. It's actually used in the kitchen quite a bit. Um, it's very easy to um, uh, solidify, and the cells like it. They don't, um, they, they don't die or anything in it, which is important in and by itself, of course. However, the cells don't grab those polymer structures, so that functionality is not there. So we had to um, engineer that a little bit. We had to um, add some small peptides, RGD peptides, attached to the polymer uh, structure of that alginate so that the cells can actually recognize that um, part and start grabbing those polymer structures. And then you see here on the y-axis, um, basically the, the water um, expulsion of the gel um, translating into a volume reduction, very similar to what you saw in that Petri dish with, that, uh, with those uh, silk wires. So we are currently um, also have also replaced the animal component in the in the gel. Um, a, a project that is very dear to me is uh, uh, recycling. Um, I didn't mention well, I did mention, but maybe not sufficiently, is that obviously the cells need to be fed as well. And what do we typically feed them? We feed them uh, sugar as an energy um, source. Uh, amino acids as building blocks for the, the proteins, vitamins, minerals, and a couple of other things so that they um, can actually build new uh, cells. Now, what we typically do, we grow the cells in that liquid, um, and the cells start to become metabolically active. Uh, and when they are metabolically active, they produce ammonium and they produce lactate and all these waste products that um, are basically sitting in that same uh, fluid. So if you like, they're growing in their own uh, urine. They don't have kidneys, so they cannot get the expose, uh, cannot, cannot um, expose themselves of the ammonium and the lactate. Um, so that's why after three days, we have to take out the medium and uh, pour fresh medium onto the cells. Now that's a very wasteful system because we have, uh, this is, um, you may recognize all the, the 22 amino acids that we have uh, on the left, the essential amino acids, so the amino acids that we cannot make and that cows cannot make either. On the right, the non-essential amino acids that we can basically produce ourselves from uh, glucose or fat uh, sources. So if you look even after seven days of culture, which is already longer than we typically do, you see that a lot of those amino acids are still there. Uh, they are not used by the cells yet. Um, and so if we throw that away, it becomes a very um, wasteful system. So we are currently uh, doing a couple of things. One is to design the feed in such a way that the waste product accumulation is as little as possible. Um, but we also extract those waste materials um, and supplement the amino acids that are being depleted. So for instance, you see here from, from the graph in this instance that isoleucine and leucine are depleted quite a bit and phenylalanine, but lysine and histidine, not so much. Um, so you can selectively add those uh, amino acids to the mix and extend the uh, use of your medium uh, for a much longer time. Then how about the, can you actually make this cost effective? And um, uh, of course, you know, $300,000 for a hamburger is ridiculous. You cannot really um, uh, uh, market that in any shape or form. Um, and you have to realize that this is a medical technology. So um, all the ingredients are really, really expensive. And the labor is, by the way, also expensive. So we have factored all that in into that $330,000. Uh, and of course, also handmade, not at scale. Uh, but if you go down into what is really the cost driver of this is, it's really the feed. Very similar to animals, actually. It's really the feed that is the biggest cost um, part of this uh, technology. So um, recycling becomes an important issue. Um, 
the the serum free components the 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 triggers the stimuli that we need to add to the medium to replace serum are actually very very expensive uh, they're also very powerful but they are very very expensive um, and the ingredients are all the amino acids are all pharma grade um, and the amino acids that are pharma grade are essentially the same as the amino acids that are feed grade they're just much more expensive um, so if you factor all that in um, with uh, the with uh, scaling up production um, actually without uh, exchanging the pharma grade building blocks like sugar and amino acids for uh, for feed grade you end up of a it, it, with a cost price of about 140 euro per kilo so roughly 160 dollars per kilo or something which is still quite a bit of course um, and would at best be a very niche product um, so how can you get from that 140 euro per kilo to let's say five euro per kilo um, and this is where really animal feed comes in um, so we are collaborating with a number of animal feed companies uh, to look at hydrolysis from uh, sugar beets from fodder beets from peas from um, soy, from wheat, from maize, uh, corn, um, and uh, look whether we can replace all those pharma grade ingredients with uh, feed grade ingredients. Um, that they have the scale and the low price that is required to make this into a uh, product. So we are collaborating with quite a few of those feed producers and we, we're happy to, uh, to extend it. This is, by the way, also true for um, uh, uh, food additions um, uh, that are used in the animal feed, we are uh, uh, systematically testing whether they, it makes sense to actually add them to the medium of these cells as well. Um, so this is one example of those uh, hydrolysis. Uh, these are hydrolysis from plant proteins uh, and they are commercially available. Um, uh, for reasons of um, uh, 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 secrecy or confidentiality, I cannot list these, the sources of these hydrolysis. I apologize for that. Um, on the y-axis, this is actually these are tested against a backdrop of um, a cell culture uh, medium, so that that fluid with no amino acids. So we have stripped all the amino acids from there and replaced it with a, a hydrolysis um, from a plant protein. And you see that some of those hydrolysis actually have a functionality of 100%, so very similar to the original uh, medium, and some even have a higher functionality. Because there are two things. One is that, um, yes, these hydrolysis are just replacers of the building blocks that we use for cell culture, uh, but some of them have also additional growth factor like activity so that the cells actually grow faster um, if we give the hydrolysis rather than uh, the regular medium so there's a lot of potential here for um, collaboration and also for improving the the process now the final thing that i wanted to discuss and i will do this very briefly is that consumers may not be too happy with these developments um, that was kind of um, clear from that 2013 launch that some some people dubbed this uh, Frankenstein food and um, uh, lab grow and, and lab chops and, and what have you. Um, so there was quite a bit of reservation against this technology and that's understandable because we are biologically programmed not to eat stuff that we don't know. It's novel, it's new. Um, so um, at some point um, Hot dogs were novel. At some point, frozen food was novel. Uh, and initially, that led to very similar reactions. In the beginning, people would not trust frozen food because, well, it had been frozen. Can you still eat it afterwards? Um, so every time such an innovation happens, people have to get used to the idea that something is novel. Um, I use the example of a hot dog because if I go to, you may be different, but if I go to a general pu uh, public, uh, people don't know what a hot dog is. They don't know what it's made of or how it's being made. And still they eat it quite happily. Um, and they do that because everybody does. And apparently it works. Apparently you, it's, it's safe enough. Um, 
So we have to gradually kind of develop a trust in a product. Uh, and obviously regulatory approval uh, is a, a big player in this. Uh, the other thing is that um, we transform something that is called natural to something that is man-made. Natural, like these cows, um, you know, that's, it is millions of years of evolution and we cannot really change that. So there's not really a lot that can go wrong. Um, but if you convert that into human hands, then um, all things, all of sorts of things might go wrong. So we basically said, well, this is, um, you know, think about, you, you can think about large factories where, you know, far away countries, um, our meat is being made and we don't know whether we can trust that. But you can also think of a microbrewery type of system where you, for instance, have a small farm in the middle of a neighborhood with a couple of cows, a couple of chicken, a couple of uh, um, pigs, uh, kids uh, feed them, they pet them, they, this is the petting zoo type of thing. Um, they pet them, um, and in the meantime, they're actually stem cell donors. So once in a while, you take um, a stem cell from them or stem cells from them, and you grow meat for the entire community. Um, uh, the, the food is also locally produced and um, so then people can visit this at any time they want so then you have much more control over how your food is being produced. Um, so I'm not going to say that this is kind of the ideal um, situation in the future uh, because there's also a lot of advantages of scaling up of course um, but it at, at least tells the story that we tend to confuse innovation with how it's being implemented in society and, um, uh, and then, then is associated with loss of control. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, so in the end, um, there's also, uh, meat is also uh, uh, much more than just a food product. It's a whole culture around it, a whole romantic system of, you know, cowboys, uh, power, masculinity, fire. Um, and that's part of the appeal as well. Uh, less so now than maybe uh, 30 years ago. And a lab doesn't have that appeal, right? There's fire as well, but not as appealing as, uh, as a campfire. And so people don't really associate labs with something where your um, meat should be come from. Of course, this will never happen. If this is going to happen, then it will be in, in uh, fermentation um, setups and factories. Um, so I won't have time to really discuss this. This is a study that we did where we basically asked participants, uh, you know, is this acceptable to you? Do you want to eat it? Uh, do you want to taste it? And um, we looked at the type of information that we need to give to people to, um, and whether that type of information actually affected their acceptance. Um, I will skip through this quickly and we'll go to this overview, uh, which is a little bit more instructive where um, the, uh, the bright blue bars um, are the people who accept this. Um, these are surveys that have been done from 2013 up to quite recently in different geographical uh, areas. And you see that gradually um, acceptance is increasing um, up till, you know, in some cases up to 50% of the people actually saying that they accept this and that they want to um, uh, try this. Uh, there are lots of other possibilities. If you start doing this, you can make the meat a healthier product by, for instance, coercing those fat cells to make uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and um, eventually, not now, but eventually, you can also use this to make a steak. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, one company is actually doing that already. Um, it has to be approved. In Europe, it has to be approved by EFSA. Uh, because it's a novel food. In the US, it also has to be approved uh, by FDA and uh, USDA. They recently um, uh, submitted guidelines for that. Um, so that's in the works. And when we started in 2008, we were the only ones in the world. And right now there are about 50, 60 companies in the world doing this. There are a couple in the US, a couple in Israel, a couple in uh, Europe, it's actually worldwide. Some are focusing on beef, some on chicken, some on pork, some on fish. Uh, because every um, animal that has these stem cells in their muscle, you can actually do this with. Um, 
So I, I hope I um, have convinced you that this is actually worth pursuing. Um, and we probably may not agree on it, but you know, it, it, in my mind, the, the global issues are, are getting the really concerning. So I think we all should be thinking about this. Um, Fat production is, is uh, necessary in addition to what we have done in 2013. Scale up and scale out is still a formidable task. This is not going to be a disruption. Uh, it's at best a transformation that will take another 15, 20 years because we, we for this complete um, production system to be built up. Um, cost effectiveness is a function of technology recycling and feedstock selection. And eventually I'm pretty convinced we will get there, although we have still quite some ways to go um, and regulatory approval is required and is actually uh, not only required but also desirable because you want to make sure that this is a safe product. I cannot imagine it not to be but you want to be absolutely sure that it is. So um, this is uh, part of our team. Um, right now we are with 70 people uh, working on this, 7-0, working on this uh, every day to uh, to make this happen as soon as possible. And uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm I'm more than happy to entertain questions. All right, thank you, Mark. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions that were submitted during today's presentation. As the global leader in choline, Balchem has spent more than 50 years perfecting the art and science of choline chloride production. The new Puricol line delivers the highest standards of quality, produced in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, and backed by the strictest process controls for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you can't find anywhere else. Turn to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem for an unmatched level of quality you can trust. Visit balchemanh.com to learn more. Dr. Post, so as a marketing guy, I'm kind of interested is who do you really see as, as your target market for this, this product? And, and maybe that's a, a, a both a near-term and a long-term question, but you started off talking about the fact that, um, that, that beef, the way it's raised today is, is not cost effective is that really the concern at this point or is it is it something else that you're targeting uh, you mean traditional beef or yes, this, yes. This um yeah it, it's not so much a cost issue I, I i believe it's more like a resource well in terms of environmental cost and 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 resource cost um i think um the, the the target audience, the first target, eventually the target target audience is really the meat eater, right? So the all of all of the meat eaters, including myself, um, and um, the initial target audience, which will be most receptive to this, um, as indicated by um, the surveys, are basically younger people um, below the age of thirty. Um, and, and even if if I go around the world and talk about this, um, even at um, you know pop uh, uh, kind of festivals, uh, people below 25, 30 see this as a very credible alternative and a desirable alternative. Um, so I think those would be probably the first. Um, I think it's a little bit difficult to think about you know um, novel markets like Asia um, and uh, and India. Uh, especially India, Asia, uh, China is getting there, but India is still um, kind of a black box. Um, and obviously they also have religious issues. Um, but, um, you know, the, the first audience I think would be the, the younger crowd in, um, in the U.S., in, in, in developed nations, basically. And, and when do you see this being uh, accepted and, and commercially available to, to consumers? Uh, yeah, so um, recently, a couple of weeks ago, the first product was actually uh, regulated um, and approved in Singapore. It's a, a chicken nugget from uh, Eat Just, the company in, in the US. Um, 
very, very expensive, like $500 for a portion of chicken nuggets. Um, but it's the first kind of milestone in terms of uh, regulatory approval. So um, what most of the companies will do, because in the beginning it's expensive and the scale is quite small, they will go through high-end restaurants and um, uh, maybe specialty stores. Um, for it to get to the supermarket level, it really needs to come down in price to be maybe not quite on par with regular meat, but not much more, um, not, not like more than a factor two above that um, for it to get to the supermarket. That may happen in the next two, three years, uh, but it can also take a little bit longer. So you had mentioned that this is not gonna be at least disruptive initially. As you look into your crystal ball, 10, 15 years down the road, what percent of uh, the, the protein that humans will be consuming will be from plant protein, animal protein, and then, you know, synthetic or, or, or lab-based protein? Yeah, um, 10, 15 years is maybe, well, 10 years is rather short. I think um, uh, 15, 20 years, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will be a 50-50 balance uh, between uh, 50 conventional and 50 uh, everything else. Um, and it may actually go faster than that, but I, I think 50-50 in 20 years from now is a reasonable, uh, at least that's what I think is, um, is, is uh, it's, it, there's a possibility that that will happen. All right, so kind of, um, a little different direction here. What role will gene splicing play in all of this? And will you be able to create designer meats, uh, you know, that maybe is a combination of beef, chicken, pork to meet the consumer needs and tastes? Uh, yeah, well, that would not be the most obvious route, but um, if, if I would make a combination between beef and chicken, I would probably mix the cells <laughs> and, um, um, and start to make it that way. But uh, yeah, there is obviously the possibility to play um, not so much with splicing, but with gene editing, for instance, and maybe that was also what was worth mentioned. Um, with uh, gene editing, I, I see more of an application where uh, you actually make the meat or the fat uh, healthier. That's um, something that I look much more forward to than, um, than making exotic meats. But you can, of course, also imagine that you take stem cells from animals that we currently don't eat because just there are not enough around. Um, and you can also think about um, uh, maybe changing the meat in such a way that some of the detrimental components, maybe for some um, specialty diets are reduced or not there. All right, I've got a question from Douglas. Every time new biotechnology is introduced to improve the efficiency of animal production and reduce the carbon footprint of animal production, consumers reject it. Examples are growth hormones, uh, beta antagonists, etc. Why will this be different? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And um, uh, I, I kind of read the frustration uh, of the, the, the the person who asked the question uh, of Doug um, on, on, on the uh, aversion against it or against change. Um, I think some of the, um, my, my feeling is a little bit different here. Um, and um, I feel that a lot of people out there, um, a lot of consumers actually would like to see a credible alternative for meat, um, and, and I'm not vilifying the industry. I, I, I'm a meat eater myself. I, you know, I thank the industry for being able to pre, uh, to to um, uh, supply me with that. Um, but I think also a lot of people feel uneasy about it, and um, currently they have nowhere to go because there are no credible alternatives. Once there are credible alternatives, that that will change. I think. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that 
already 50% of the people, now this is a survey with all the limitations of the surveys that I understand, but the fact that 50% of the people are willing to look at a product that um, is made in this way, very artificial, very um, uncommon or um, to, to them, but still are willing to look at it as an alternative for meat is for me a, a sign that people are um, actually waiting for an alternative to come up. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm looking at it from a different, different perspective than most of you do. Um, and it's still admittedly a, a product that is not available. So we don't really know the adherence um, as of yet. All right, the next question comes from Carrie, and you've, you've kind of addressed this, but maybe it'll give you another opportunity to kind of double down on, but what can you tell us about the nutritional requirements of lab-based meat? How is it produced, delivered, et cetera, and how expensive is the feedstock? And what is the efficiency of nutrient use by the cultures? Uh, yeah, so um, the efficiency of, the, this is actually the most important part, um, I think, the uh, efficiency of nutrient your, uh, uh, use. Um, and that is about one to one and a half. So uh, conversion, so we need one and a half times more um, building block ingredients um, than we act, than actually end up in the proteins in the meat. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, a one to one ratio. We still lose um, uh, material. Uh, but it's a, a lot better than uh, a cow. Yeah, kind of building on that. So in, in animal agriculture, we're still learning an awful lot about the nutrient requirements of animals. I'm, I'm kind of curious about uh, what you've learned about nutrient requirements of just muscle and and what what are you doing perhaps to, to refine that uh, understanding? All right, well, that's, that's a good point, of course. Um, if you... If you uh, feed a cow, <laughs> then you get more material out of it than just muscle. Um, and we currently don't take that into account. Um, now, you can think of that two ways. You can think of it as, um, uh, well, uh, you need to add up all these things to, to get to the same kind of efficiency level um, or to at least be able to compare them. Um, so currently, I, I have another startup company that uses the same technology to make leather, um, which is actually a little bit easier to make. Um, and there are, um, as you know, also alternatives for gelatin. Um, so I think um, I look at all the other, I'm not sure whether this was the question, but I, I look at other other side products. Leather is a particularly good example, but um, uh, which is a very obviously useful material. And I'm, I'm not saying that the other things are not useful, but they are mostly um, developed to, because there is this byproduct um, of a cow. If you no longer have the cows, you have to think of, well, what is it going to replace? What, what is it going to replace by? And a lot of the gelatin applications can actually be replaced by by plant gelatins, so I'm, I'm or uh, plant gels. So I'm not entirely. Sh it, it's a difficult issue. It's it's a complex uh, comparison. But um, um, I think what we will see, same by the way, is true for milk. Um, although these are separate production systems in most countries. In in the Netherlands, as you might know, seventy percent, seventy five percent of all our beef actually comes from dairy cows. So it's a byproduct in a way in our country of dairy. Um, but a, a lot of technologies and companies are being, are started to replace those materials as well. All right, thank you. And we've passed the top of the hour. So I'm gonna end with this uh, one last question from Devin. Uh, can you comment on how this may alter the production systems in low income countries, which have logistical complications with distribution of this type of product, but also, have more unsustainable production systems? Right. Um, well, um, I think if, if, you, if you agree with the, um, the, the notion that you require less resources for this, 
uh, in terms of feed and water, then uh, there should be an advantage, right? There should be an advantage of uh, being able in uh, remote areas or in areas where there is low intensity um, uh, food production to actually um, uh, implement this. Um, what you will require is some level of, um, you know, sophistication of the labor force, which is uh, obviously also um, something that will not be um, apparent everywhere. Um, but I think because of the the, the resource uh, usage, the favorable resource kind of uh, usage, it's probably easier to disseminate this uh, among um, uh, areas that are currently not intensively farmed um, than um, making them um, farming intensive. I'm not sure if yeah. that answers the question, but I... Um, um, well, I thank you for that. Um, and, and, and thank uh, everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them along with the unanswered questions from today's session. The next Real Science Lecture Series webinar will be on February 2nd, when we will hear from Dr. Kevin Harbatine from Penn State University as he discusses feeding for milk fat production. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. The Real Science Exchange offers a casual discussion around the virtual pub table, getting to know top industry professionals and researchers like you've never known them before. Go behind the scenes and hear the conversations take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to follow us. There are currently six episodes available and they release on the first and third Tuesday of every month. You can listen to all the past episodes at balchemanh.com slash podcast. And on behalf of Balchem and Dr. Post, thank you for joining us today.